Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. My guest on today's episode, Stuart Green, is the author of a new book called Criminalizing Sex. He is a criminal law professor at Rutgers Law School in New Jersey. And we're talking about the criminal law and sex. Everything from how the Me Too movement and feminist activists have reshaped not only our cultural norms and our understanding and attitudes, but also how this has affected and shaped the developing criminal law when it comes to rape, when it comes to consent, uh, and also other kinds of activities where we're talking not so much about the autonomy, the freedom of someone not to be uh, contacted in a sexual way, in an unwanted way, but also the freedom to engage in certain sexual activities that should not be limited or regulated by the criminal law. Uh, and you may be surprised by some of the things that a liberal theorist like Stuart Green would include in that category of uh, activities. Uh, a fascinating book and what and a, an extremely relevant and important a conversation we have on today's episode, the Harvey Weinstein conviction of several weeks ago, still fresh on our minds and thinking about how does the criminal law need to change? How has it changed to deal with the changing times we live in when it comes to sex? Stay tuned for this great conversation. I want to welcome my guest today, Stuart Green, to talk about the law of sex and specifically criminalizing sex, which also is the title of his new book, Criminalizing Sex. Stuart, thank you very much for being on Good Law, Bad Law. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I, yeah, I, this is, um, I was obviously very intrigued by the title uh, and by the subject matter. I uh, read my way through most of the book, um, and you know we we know just from the news headlines how important this issue is. From the Me Too movement to Harvey Weinstein's recent trial, uh, to major major uh, sweeping changes in the criminal law when it comes to sex, uh, and uh, I so I want to. Talk about how you've approached this subject, because this is not a book about the headlines on, on this issue, but really trying to understand, as I, as I read it, how the law makes sense of sex. It's a very difficult subject for the law to, 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 to deal with. And so, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Stuart, and, and about the book and, and what you set out to do in the book. And then we have so many uh, specific points that we can talk about to illustrate the issue in specific cases as well. But give us some background first on yourself and on this new book of yours. Sure. Well, I uh, have been a law professor for 25 years now, and I've been focused on criminal law. I also teach criminal procedure, and I, I, I have been at Rutgers Law School for the last decade. And I have written and thought for most of those years about what kinds of things we ought to criminalize in 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 our liberal society. And we have the most um, coercive sanction that society can use, which is the criminal sanction. We really need to use it sparingly, but appropriately mm -hmm. to further appropriate goals. And yeah. so I, I, I had written already in over the last 15 years or so a couple of other earlier books that looked at uh, white collar crime and also the law of theft and related property crimes. And I was sort of thinking about what I would do next. And, and my focus has been on what we call the special part of the criminal law, which is the part that makes specific conduct a crime. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that I, I found myself invited to a couple of conferences uh, when I was first beginning to think about what the next book would be about. 
And one, one conference was on the law of rape and sexual assault and focusing on the non-consensual offenses. And the other conference that I went to within the same six-month period was on what was termed vice crimes. So things that um, are not non-consensual in, in the way that rape and sexual assault are, but prostitution and adult incest. And what I found was that the conversation at those two conferences really seemed very separate. There, were, there, was, there was very little, there were very few points of contact between them. And that seemed to me puzzling because Everybody was talking about consent and autonomy and liberal values and feminist critiques. And it just seems strange to me that there was so little connection between those two conversations. So the book tries to bridge that, to bridge those two conversations and to look at both the consensual and non-consensual offenses under a sort of a single umbrella, if you will, or, or, or a big tent and, and think about how we should regulate and criminalize sexual behavior um, of a very wide uh, of a very wide sort. Well, and 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 the subtitle of the book, by the way, is a unified liberal theory. And the the last time I heard anyone try to come up with a unified theory of anything, it was of the universe. So, uh, <laughs> so this is a, uh, this is a pretty ambitious goal by the by the nature of the title. And um, you. You set things out in terms of um, this idea of, of our being in a liberal society, and I want you to explain that because in case there are there's anybody listening who regards themselves as a conservative and thinks, "Oh my God, there goes another liberal." I know, I know, you mean this in a different way, uh, right? But so, so I want you to explain that because you divide up the the, the types of criminal law that apply or should apply to sexual or sex-related crimes and to those uh, where somebody is um, infringing on someone else's autonomy and those situations where somebody's own autonomy is being infringed on by being denied the opportunity to in engage in a sexual activity that they choose consensually to participate in. I mean, I think that's a very interesting framework for trying to understand the different ways that our criminal law tries to make sense of se uh, sex related crimes but maybe you can yeah, kind of so, introduce us to that so i think a little bit of historical context might be useful um so you know traditionally in our culture we have criminalized sexual behavior sort of taking our lead from religious prescripts and, um, you know, conservative sort of legal, what we call legal moralistic values. So in other words, if the Bible says that uh, homosexuality is a sin, then our law, until well into the 20th century, basically followed that approach. Uh, similarly, um, you know, if you look in the Hebrew Bible, it's full of proscriptions regarding mm -hmm. sexual behaviors, whether it's incest or bestiality or so forth. And that was where we sort of took the lead. Um, in the mid 19th century or early 19th century, this notion of liberalism, really identified with John Stuart Mill, uh, came into play, which was that uh, in a society where we are individuals and where people have different values and different traditions, that the government ought to sort of keep hands off, except for that conduct which is really harmful or produces the risk of harm which would violate the rights of others. So I can engage in whatever conduct I want as long as I don't harm others or violate other people's rights. That's kind of the liberal, that's the kind of liberalism that we're talking about as opposed to, you know, political liberalism that we talk about right. in connection with the presidential election. It's almost, and, without, without wanting to introduce confusing labels, it is really more a libertarian view of liberalism. I mean, it's based on <clears throat> autonomy or freedom Right. Uh, so, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's true. There's definitely a libertarian streak in it. But I think the difference between liberalism and libertarianism is that uh, liberals are open to the idea of regulation to try to achieve liberal values. In mm -hmm. other words, if uh, liberals are concerned about whether people really are going to be able to decide who they 
uh, don't want to have sexual contact with. And it's appropriate for the government to step in and protect that negative right to autonomy. Whereas a libertarian might say that government intervention is sort of uh, problematic on its own terms, and therefore mm -hmm. we should be hesitant about having the government intervene. So I think the liberal, in the sense that I'm using it, is more open to using government, including criminal law, to protect people's rights, uh, as opposed to just kind of letting the market, as it were, work mm -hmm. its way in, in, um, in this area. Okay. Um, and feminist, of course, in the latter part of the 20th century, began saying, look, this whole system that we have is, you know, intended to further male hierarchies, and especially the law of rape, which had the marital rape exemption. In other words, that it was impossible for a man to rape his wife, uh, his mm -hmm. wife under the traditional English common law and other kinds of laws that had the effect of basically discriminating against women. So they urged various proposals and reforms, which they've largely been successful uh, in achieving. So that's where things sort of stood late in the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century. We have um, still remnants of a legal moralistic approach. We still have prostitution as criminalized, you know, in almost every American state. We still have the criminalization of adult incest. We still have the criminalization of sadomasochistic behavior. Uh, and that's, again, that, that sort of echoing the traditional moralistic approach that we saw in earlier times. And then we have the feminist-influenced revision of codes in which the definition of rape is being defined more broadly mm -hmm. and the definition of sexual assault and new offenses are being created which protect uh, or do a better job of protecting all people, but particularly women who have traditionally been the victims of um, sexual imposition. Well, and, and I want to so, I want to yeah. come back to rape and talk about that in, in more detail. As uh, you spend a good good bit of uh, the book talking about that, um, but it's been, it's fascinating to me how, on the one hand you can argue we're seeing a move in the way criminal law looks at sexual crimes. We're moving away from a more, more morality-based or religiously moral-based approach. Uh, I mean, you gave the example of homosexuality. I mean, the, the decriminalization of sodomy laws was, a, was really a, an, an important step towards same-sex marriage. Uh, being recognized as a constitutionally protected uh, right. Um, so on the one hand, we you're you're arguing we're moving away from morality or religiously moral based uh, underpinnings for criminal law. And but but I wonder, I mean, anybody who's read Justice Kennedy's opinion in the Obergefell case, the the, the case that recognized same sex. Um, marriage as being a lawful constitutionally protected marriage i mean his opinion apart from being beautifully written is is very morally based it seems to me i mean he's talking about dignity personal autonomy he's not talking about um religion per se but he certainly has he's certainly aware of the moral imperative that he sees as behind the way he uh relates the constitution to this issue. So where, where do you, how do you see those trends, you know, evolving and bringing us to where we are today? Right. So I'm, I'm hardly suggesting that we should rid the criminal law of morality. On, on the contrary, I mean, I'm what criminal law theorists refer to as a retributivist, or I'm a negative retributivist. In other words, I think that we should only public, we should only punish people when they deserve to be punished, when they've done mm -hmm. morally bad uh, things, in particular when they have infringed the rights of others. So that's a, that's a moralistic view, or it's a mm -hmm. moral, uh, morality-informed view. And I think we need to make hard decisions in the criminal law all the time about uh, grading offenses. For example, what's, you know, how do we decide which is a worse offense, you know, imposing 
penetrative sex on somebody or groping them. It seems to me that that's a moral judgment that we make if we say that one of those acts is more wrongful and therefore deserve, more deserving of punishment than the other. So right. I, I hardly suggest that we should try to get rid of morality in the criminal law. But the difference is that um, the morality that we're talking about isn't a morality that reflects individual preferences about um, how one, you know, wants to live one's sexual life. It's not a morality that's informed by religious values. It's a morality that's that is uh, in, informed by a broad uh, understanding of autonomy and um, uh, individual freedom to chart one's own path, mm -hmm. and that we should, you know, we should um, design our legal system in a way that furthers that that value. But that is a moral value. It's, right, uh, I, don't, sure. I don't deny that that's the case. Um, I guess Justice Kennedy, in um, the uh, same-sex marriage case, I mean, marriage is a little bit different because marriage is, in a sense, a a moral good. We're saying, look, it's good that people are married. I think that very much is reflected in his opinion there. That's a good thing for society and so forth. That's a little bit different from the criminal law. The criminal law doesn't say that we should do X or Y because it's good for society. They're saying people have sort of zones of privacy. And I think the more relevant case is probably Lawrence versus Texas, which is the preceding case, which says that the state has no business in uh, coming into people's homes and arresting them for having private adult consensual sexual mm -hmm. behavior mm. when that doesn't when it doesn't affect anybody if the right. if the conduct is is consensual then that's good enough and that's a very liberal view um and that's the view that I'm trying to explore what the implications of that view are in this in this in this uh in this work Okay, so uh, so so what then, uh, Stuart? What are what are the trends? I mean, is is the law? I mean, I think your view is that the law has had some very dramatic, has seen some very dramatic changes. The criminal law has when it comes to uh, sex, sex or sexually related crimes. How how would you characterize the the trend that has you know from the from the seventies? you know, the earliest, uh, you know, days of the feminist movement, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's early work up to where we are today, where the Me Too movement is, is sort of prominent in, in how we understand our culture in terms of sex. Right. So there's a kind of a divergence that we can observe. And on the one hand, we've been talking about consensual behavior. So whether it's uh, same-sex sexual encounters or adult pornography or adultery or fornication, um, those are acts that are at least putatively consensual. And we, I can talk a little bit later about what I mean by that, but they're, if we assume that they are consensual, then it's, it's pretty clear that our society is much more uh, likely to decriminalize that conduct, to legalize it, to recognize that people can make their own decisions about whether they want to have sadomasochistic uh, sex or they want to have sex with their, you know, their adult sibling or whether they want to have sex with um, their uh, someone outside of marriage, that the, the law has become much more permissive or liberal, if you will, with respect to that kind of uh, that kind of behavior. And I think that reflects generally the view, the sort of sexual revolution that occurred in the late 20th century. Uh, the greater availability of effective birth control and the advent of hookup culture and the widespread accessibility of pornography and certainly new respect for L LGBTQ rights and, and new means of communication. People on the internet who are communicating with other people who have similar kinds of sexual mm -hmm. interests uh, that they have that, that couldn't, couldn't have reached those people before the internet made it possible. So that's sort of one side of the coin. On the other side, though, we've had this recognition largely achieved by feminist activists and scholars, which is that the law isn't really adequately protecting the right of people, and particularly women, not to have the sex that they don't want to have, their negative mm -hmm. autonomy, mm -hmm. that women are still being subjected to um, 
rape and sexual assault and grope, groping and other kinds of uh, behavior. And we've seen new laws that address sex, sex trafficking and child grooming and revenge porn. And, the, and a very significant expansion in the definition of rape and sexual assault. So there we see greater punitiveness. So we, we have these two trends, one pointing in the direction of greater permissiveness and the other pointing in the direction of greater punitiveness. And the question is, on the whole, in the, in the broadest terms, those seem consistent with each other. But when you really begin to get down into the weeds, you begin to see that sometimes there's a conflict. And sometimes when well, and that, we... Yeah. yeah. Well, the, and 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 hearing you describe those two trends, for, first of all, before we get to conflict, I mean, it does seem there is some consistency if you're thinking about these in liberal terms. That is, you want to be more free to do things that you sh you ought to have autonomy uh, over yourself and and a partner or multiple partners i guess as long as it's consensual you ought to have greater autonomy and not be restricted in your autonomy as to those things on the other hand if you've done something wrong as you point out that is the role of the criminal law and that is there is a moral basis to that uh which is also a liberal moral basis and in, and if the criminal law doesn't adequately cover what are those things that are wrongs? Uh, th then, then you hope the trend line is is moving towards, as you say, greater punitiveness over conduct that is indeed wrongful. Those would seem to be both positive and morally based and 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 liberally rooted trends in the law. That should be a good thing. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm. Uh, I don't really argue that, you know, liberalism is better than legal moralism. I mean, I kind of assume that it is, or I, I, I say, well, let's start with John Stuart Mill's understanding and the understanding of other scholars who followed in his wake, and, and let's see where it leads us. You know, how mm -hmm. can we construct a system which reflects that value rather than offering a positive argument in favor of liberalism, because you can't do everything in, in you know, one book. <laughs> so the idea here is to say, okay, well, if we accept certain liberal precepts, where is that going to lead us in terms of specific uh, acts and, um, and, and questions that arise? Well, I mean, personally, I think it's kind of hard to argue against anything rooted in the idea of freedom, but uh, right. I don't know, leave that, leave that debate to others as you have. Yeah, talk to uh, Justice Scalia, uh, you know, who right. dissented in Lawrence and um, said that, no, when we allow people to engage in these kinds of behaviors uh, that, uh, that the Bible doesn't permit, that, that that's the beginning of, of the erosion of social values. Lord Devlin was a famous English jurist in the 1960s who had a famous debate with the liberal philosopher H.L.A. Hart, and they... And it was all about that. It was specifically mm -hmm. about whether Britain should legalize prostitution or not. Mm -hmm. And Lord Devlin said, you know, this is, if we legalize prostitution, the next thing you know, we'll have to legalize other kinds of behaviors that are also uh, destructive of, uh, well, actually, the specific, they, they were looking at both homosexuality and prostitution. In the end, they said in what's famous, famous report called the Wolfenden Report, in the end, they said that uh, private consensual homosexual behavior should be legalized, um, but the um, uh, the prostitution not really. And uh, and Hart and and Devlin had a famous dialogue about about that report and whether it was properly um, whether it was right or not. Um, well, and, and even in the even in the popular culture, I mean, uh, in in much more recent times. I mean, in the lead up to, uh, you know, the, the, the proposition in California that, that sought to legalize same-sex marriage before it got to the Supreme Court, there were still those arguments being made. You know, well, if yeah. two men are going to get married, what next? Are they going to marry their dog? And we're going to be okay right. with bestiality? And I mean, those right. same kinds of arguments. Uh, yeah, or polygamy, still... um, polygamy, incest, and so forth. I mean, it's, it's really head-turning uh, to see how quickly, uh, you know, social values have changed. Really, just during the, if you remember during the Obama administration, uh, 
uh, Joe Biden sort of got out ahead of the president and and mm-hmm. approved uh, and argued for gay marriage. I think before Obama had quite right. gotten there, and that was considered that that wasn't very long ago, right? And um, mm-hmm. and the Supreme Court followed suit soon thereafter. And right. um, you know, it's it's and meanwhile the Me, Me Too movement, I think, at least as quickly or even more quickly has begun to change people's attitudes about what's permissible and what's not. Well, so, all right. So you were starting to take us to some points where these two trends may conflict and that, that is, that's, you know, the, the right to be autonomous to do things and the right to be autonomous, not to have things done to you that you don't want done to you. In, right. in, and and uh, how what wh- what are some of the ways in which you see these conflicting in right. in, in the criminal law? Because that's that seems pretty important to try to understand. Yeah, so there's a lot of discussion of that in the book, and I'll just try to give you a couple of uh, illustrative examples. Um, so think about uh, how we deal with uh, sex involving people with disabilities of one sort or another, say mental dis- disabilities. Um, and if you look at the the 19th century and really into the 20th century, there was a there was a sense that well, people with people with mental disabilities um, really shouldn't be having sex at all because um, they're not really capable of understanding that uh, what they're doing, and we want to protect them. It was sort of a paternalistic interest in protecting them. Then, in the latter part of the 20th century, we see kind of a movement um based on uh the rights of the disabled and so forth and understanding that um that 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 people with mental disabilities may have uh, sexual interest and desires and we need to be careful about uh over uh criminalizing conduct that involves people with disabilities so for example we have various laws that say that make it a crime for uh someone to have sex with a partner who is um, mentally disabled. Mm. So in New Jersey, we had a widely uh, noticed case of a professor, um, actually at my university, although I didn't know her, a philosophy professor who was very uh, strong in favor of the rights of the disabled. And she began to have a sexual relationship with a young man who was nonverbal. And there was a, a, a debate that about how mentally capable he was. Mm. So she believed that he was more mentally capable than uh, the sort of doctors who had examined him believed he was. So maybe she was misguided, maybe not. But in any event, she had a sexual relationship with him. His parents, uh, his family were very concerned about that. And she was ultimately prosecuted under a New, Jer- New Jersey law that um, specifically makes it a crime for a person to have uh, sexual relations with a person who is severely mentally disabled. Um, she, she, the case went to trial. She was actually convicted. The conviction was reversed on appeal. But uh, the, the, the case is sort of worthwhile to look at because it really illustrates the, where the conflict lies. This was mm-hmm. a young man. He was 30, not so young. He was, I think, almost 30 in his late 20s. He had never had any kind of sexual relationship before. This was a woman who really cared for him by every measure, was willing to leave her husband to be with him and so forth. And however misguided she may have been, um, she seemed to have his interest at heart. Uh, And so it may be that the law in that arena is, while it's really intending to protect people who are often sexually victimized, uh, and that's, of course, a good thing. The question is, you know, has it been drawn too broadly? Is there, is there, is it possible is there sort of an uh, uh, an exit valve to cover those cases where uh, there isn't that kind of uh, victimization going on, but 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 something else that's more benign? So there's a case where you know there, it may be overly broad, and we want to we want to tailor our laws to make them uh, sufficiently narrow that they that they don't apply to cases that they shouldn't apply to. Well, no, I think that's a great example because it it does. Um... I think it does illustrate the challenges for the law in 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 very individualized situations like this, where it's very hard to just look at things in in 
black and white terms to just impose labels and say, well, this person is, quote, mentally disabled. And therefore, I mean, there are all kinds of gradations of, of, of mental disability. Um, you know, just as I'm thinking of other contexts where this can come up yeah. in terms of consent. Um, I mean, for instance, you talk about um, cases where where uh, a person's ability to consent is impaired in one way or another. It could be through uh, intoxication. I mean, there's, there's right. you know, there's the well known now case, very troubling in a lot of ways, of the the Brock Turner case out in California. Right. Um, and, or the Bill, and there the are Bill plenty Cosby of other cases. Right. Well, but, but the different the, the difference with those cases. In that case, that, yeah. At least in the Cosby case, I guess we can say this is what he was convicted of at this point. He was giving intoxicants right. to, a, to a woman in order to put her in a position where she couldn't resist and certainly she couldn't consent. I right. Mean, that's, that's the theory. So those are easy cases. The, the Cosby cases are easy cases. The harder cases that's are, easy. as you say, where the victim or the alleged victim has um, intoxicated herself. And yeah. You know, sometimes right. people drink precisely because they want to lower their inhibitions. So how do we allow people to do that uh, without, and but at the same time protect people who are intoxicated from being victimized? That's that's the problem. The, right. the issue also and, and, arises yeah, in ahead, cases sir. of uh, dementia, where um, yeah. uh, someone is has good days, bad days, good mornings, bad, not so good afternoons. And, you know, unless we were prepared to say that people with dementia just can't have sexual relations, we need to figure out a way that we can allow them to, to do that without exposing them to too many risks. Well, and, and, and from the so-called perpetrator's perspective, and I'm certainly not defending Brock Turner here when I, when I say this, but um, this, this is the Stanford student who was convicted of, uh, of uh, sexual assault of a woman who, after they had met at a fraternity party and uh, they were both uh, had been drinking and so on um, from, from the perspective of the so-called perpetrator makes the issue of consent also very fuzzy. How do you know how intoxicated somebody is? How do you know when impairment reaches a point where they can't consent? How does this Rutgers professor know or, or, uh, how, how, what what standard do you apply to her conduct, where it may be difficult to determine uh, what what level of a person's ability to is to consent? You talk about <clears throat> you have a whole chapter on uh, something that's become very important in in the Me Too movement in the Harvey Weinstein trial, frankly, in the Bill Clinton impeachment. You know, which is people who are in a different power position. Mm. How does that affect consent? And you know, you can see the challenges of trying to draw any bright lines there. So, how I mean, how does the criminal law deal with that? So, the way we've dealt with it in recent years has been to say there are certain kinds of relations that are just per se categorically not permitted. So, a police officer should never be having sex with someone under his control. A prison guard should never be having sex with a, a, an inmate doesn't matter whether she's willing to say it was consensual. We're just going to categorically prohibit it. Mm -hmm. Similarly, with doctors and patients, we have many states have laws that prohibit that. So mm -hmm. th those those doctrines are fairly well settled. And I think probably uh, they're probably um, properly uh, formulated. Um, but then the question is, you know, do we want to extend that sort of abuse, so-called abusive position approach to other kinds of relationships. So uh, university teachers and their students um, or clergy people and their congregants mm -hmm. and then movie producers and, you know, people who might want to make a movie with them or mm -hmm. um, business executives or powerful editors or partners in law firms or what have you. Yeah. Should, should the fact of that relationship itself be enough for us to presume the lack of consent, or, or um, even if it's a rebuttable presumption, maybe it is. Um, and so that is that is really one of the most problematic and controversial, I think, uh, issues that have arisen in, in the wake of Me Too. 
Well, so so let me ask you then, because you're taking the, your approach in your book to to exploring these very questions that we're now talking about is to, is to take a liberal approach uh, based on autonomy. And right. so you could say in the Cosby case, for example, or in the case of a police officer with someone under their control or a doctor and patient, those those are the easy cases. The criminal law can deal with the easy cases because it's hard to, you just don't want to have to wade into the weeds as to whether a patient's actually consenting to have a sexual relationship with their physician. Just, they're gonna, we're just, we're going to accept as a matter of liberalism, as you described it earlier, that some amount of regulation by government and the law is okay to protect people from having their autonomy imposed on. But from a liberal perspective, valuing autonomy, both autonomy to and autonomy from, um, you know, how do you, these are difficult, challenging cases, the tougher cases. How, how do, right. how do, how do we deal with that? How, or how do we approach that? It may, may be that there's no easy answer, but how, how do we think about those situations from the perspective that you're bringing to try to work through some of those tougher cases? Right. So, um, you know, I think one thing is that we need empirical evidence, or at least empirical evidence is is relevant. And sometimes legislators just kind of dive in and try to um, pass laws without really looking at what the impact might be. Um, and so to the extent that we do have empirical evidence about rates of victimization and um, the nature of some of these relationships, then, you know, I think we need to be careful about, uh, especially using the criminal law. We can also think about a multifaceted approach. We can think about civil remedies. We can think about disciplinary yeah. uh, actions. So um, if, if you're talking about an institutional culture, whether it's a university or a corporation or some governmental office, um, you know, we can have very uh, strict rules about uh, fraternization Mm -hmm. as we do in the military, for example. And that might be, uh, so someone's going to be disciplined or fired from their job if they violate those rules, but they won't be subject to a criminal prosecution. So that's sort of a half step, and it might be, that might be an appropriate, uh, an appropriate approach. On the other hand, where it's really a core case, uh, if it's a prison guard and an inmate, then, um, you know, I have no problem with with uh, criminally prosecuting the prison guard, because I think that that is such a potentially coercive kind of relationship that um, we just uh, we need to deal with it in the most severe terms possible. Um, so, well, yeah, I, I don't. Think that, I, yeah, I think it's an important, really important point because we really are, and your book does focus on criminal law. And you said you said right. up front we should we should have the criminal law cover wrongful conduct, but we also should be trying to apply the criminal law sparingly. And, and, and there are other ways that the law or a different kinds of law can deal with these tougher situations. I mean, your, you know, university, as you point out, can have a policy that it enforces pretty strictly against fraternization between faculty and students or, you know, we are all still guided by moral law, hopefully, you know, and, um, right. Or, whatever. you know, Me Too shows that social stigma and shaming, blaming and naming uh, so-called are very effective, right? Yeah. If somebody is going to be outed as a serial um, sexual harasser and is going to have his reputation harmed and might lose his job, that's that's pretty serious stuff. And we don't necessarily need to criminally prosecute that, that person. So um, I think that um, those those are all options. I mean, I can't cons yeah. I don't consider all of them in the book. I'm 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 a criminal law theorist, and so that's my main focus. Um, but um, you know, it's it's very it's very context specific, and um, that's that, that those are I'm trying to raise the questions that we ought to be talking about. Well, and all these, and I think yeah, all these things do 
play a role in shaping attitudes in our society and in our culture generally. And that, that can be where some of the greatest change happens just in the, in the way we, you, you know, you made this point about same sex marriage. It's, it is pretty remarkable that, yeah. you know, a, a, a president Obama was so on the fence about same sex marriage in the beginning and how right. soon after that it became Kind of a no-brainer, really. I mean, of course. Yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine that, that you know a mere I don't know how many years ago was it seven eight years ago that this was such a live yeah. issue and that um, it wasn't it was politically risky to support uh, gay marriage. Uh, at well, this point, yeah. I don't I don't think the Supreme Court they may they may pull the plug on abortion rights, but it seems highly unlikely that they're going to reverse themselves on on gay uh, gay marriage. Right. Right. And and and. Uh, Generations change. I mean, I remember it was not that long ago, it was maybe a few years ago, right as I think the whole Harvey Weinstein thing was coming out and, uh, you know, some of the anchors on TV like Matt Lauer and, and, and other uh, sort of c- celebrity type uh, cases were, were, were coming into the, um, into the headlines. And, I, and an older lawyer uh, said to me, um, you know, we were at a court conference and he said to me, God, you know, there isn't a lawyer my age who wouldn't be in a mm. whole lot of trouble by today's standards. There were just things mm. that we did right. that I'm not saying were good things, but kind of everybody was doing it. And now it'd be completely unacceptable. Um, right. You know, I thought that was very telling, obviously, because. Um, <laughs> Our, you know, our, our culture has changed. Our attitudes have changed. Different ideas about what is appropriate, not appropriate, have changed. Um, and criminal law plays some does play some part in that, for sure. But but criminal law, I think, thankfully, has statutes of limitations. So, um, although we've we've seen recently that laws has begun to change with respect to how long the statute of limitations is in sexual assault cases and and also sexual molestation of children. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there is no statute of limitations on Me Too, but um, uh, there are statutes of limitations. Well, we saw that Harvey Weinstein, many of his acts from the early days were basically outside the, the scope of uh, criminal prosecution today. Um, but we've seen, now we've seen an extension on the statute of limitations. So, so more, norms do change. Um, and whether, you know, it's right to hold people responsible for doing what they did at a time when norms were different, I think is, is a subject of, uh, that's, that's probably a good topic for another book. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing that in the church, uh, clergy abuse cases. Um, and yes. some states are passing laws broadly extending the time for people to bring claims, not limited to clergy related cases but but i think probably coming out of that experience um what, what i mean what do you make of that trend in, in you know in terms of the issues we've been talking about well i think that molesting children has always been wrong and the fact that um the church covered that up for as long as it did and 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 so forth i I don't have any problem in principle with um extending the statute of limitations there although there are always are whenever you extend statutes of limitations you do raise problems of proof and fading Mm -hmm. memories and 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 so forth so i think from a due process perspective we need to go slowly. But the idea that the norms have changed in that context seems to me misguided. I think with respect to obnoxious, sexist comments that, you know, senior partners may have made in the 80s or 90s um, when it was more acceptable to engage in that kind of conduct, I think that's a little bit different. I mean, it's... um, um, uh, that 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 seems to me that seems to me more problematic to say that somebody today should be held to um, a stand uh, the, the current uh, contemporary standards for conduct that may have occurred decades ago. Um, it, it really it really depends on what conduct we're talking about. If we're talking about molesting children, you know, there's that's 
that's a no brainer. If we're talking mm -hmm. about um, ob obnoxious uh, kinds of what verges on harassment, I think that's a harder question. Yeah. Well, and I think that extending the statute, those states that have extended the statute of limitations generally have done so where the abuse took place when the victim was a minor. Um, right. And of course, there are all kinds of problems with thinking about minors being able to consent, um, you know, in all kinds of situations. So there's, it seems like if you're going to extend the statute of limitations, that that's a good uh, yeah. way of, of doing that. And again, not just because of the issue of consent, but a sexual crime against a children, a child is one likely going to produce all kinds of, uh, has very long term, long term yeah. consequences, and also, I mean, when yeah. one thing that's characteristic of all of these or many of these non consensual sexual offenses is that it's very scary uh, to bring. It was very scary to bring these allegations. So to accuse your priest of molesting mm -hmm. you, you know, it was a terrifying thing uh, to do, and I think one of the undeniable benefits of the Me Too movement has been the idea that people can come forward and stake their claims and testify mm -hmm. and, and, and not feel that um, they're going to be in a worse position now than they already are. Right. Um, and so in the case of the, the Catholic Church abuses, for example, I mean, you have people who've lived with the, these this shame for you know decades and now they finally feel that they're able to come forward. And I think that um, the, the law allows them to do that, I think, is a positive, a positive step. Well, um, uh, let, let's talk about one last uh, area. And for, for those listening, if you want to get into the rest, and I urge you to do that, you're going to have to get Stuart's book. We'll, we'll tell you more about how to do that uh, at the end. Um, but uh, you brought up sexual harassment. and. Uh, I, I was I was I, I was fascinated by the fact that you devote a very significant sort of first part of the book to the criminal law and rape, and then really only a little bit, a few pages talking about sexual harassment. I think I know the reason why, um, but but perhaps for a lot of people, these terms can can be. Uh, you know the lines can be blurred, and, and maybe it's important to to say a bit about what the difference is and why one is more a function for the criminal law to deal with, and the other is more a function of the civil law in our in our system. Right. So the book's main focus is on those acts that we already treat as criminal in our in our law today. So we. We already treat non-consensual penetration, uh, sexual penetration. We already treat sexual contact, unwanted or not, I should say non-consensual, unwanted, uh, I should say non-consensual contact, physical contact, is already treated as a, a form of sexual assault. Um, sexual harassment typically involves non-contact, typically involves unwanted advances or what we call Unwanted contact, that is, um, cases where the non-consent is not clear, it may not be desired, but someone may consent to an act that they, at some level, are not really keen on engaging in. That's a complicated distinction. I'm not going to say more about it. But um, the sexual harassment, for the most part, in U.S. law is dealt with as a civil wrong. Um, so people can sue their employer for allowing uh, harassment to occur. And by harassment, we mean, say, repeated kinds of advances or uh, pornography in the workplace or um, uh, other kinds of uh, uh, environments that make them uncomfortable or certainly being discriminated against in terms of promotions and hiring because mm -hmm. of their sexual, uh, because of, of their sex. Um, so in the U.S., the tradition has been to deal with that as a civil wrong. The question I take up in that chapter is whether there might be some kinds of harassment that are properly dealt with as crimes. And there are some other countries that have done that. In Belgium and France and Israel, for example, mm 
They have regimes which actually treat what would be a civil wrong in the U.S. as a crime in their systems. Now, they're not prosecuted very commonly, but the law is definitely clear on the books that certain kinds of conduct would be treated as a crime. So, so what, I try to... For example, what? Because that's, that's, that does seem very different from what, the way we do things here. Right. So the cases where in, in, uh, in Belgium, for example, a woman who's walking down the street and is repeatedly harassed on the street um, can, mm. in theory, that, that can be, that can subject the harasser to a, uh, a criminal prosecution, whereas in the U.S., it almost certainly would not. So the question I take up is, you know, is it possible to sort of decide where the law, where the line should be between what we're going to treat as criminal and what we should treat as a civil wrong, if, if at all? Um, and I identify some criteria, including things like, well, where there's actual sexual contact, then I think we're we're much more inclined, we should be much more inclined to treat that as a crime. And where the conduct is repetitive, where there is a pattern and practice of repeated kinds of harassment, then we should be more inclined to treat that as criminal than if it's a single instance or a limited number of um, acts of harassment. Um, well, so, so where do you see... Stuart, where do you see the law moving in terms of, because uh, because it's it, it, if I read y y you correctly, it seems like you do see an expansion, both in terms of decriminalization of areas of sexual relations that um, we talked we talked a good bit of. Uh, uh, um, of, of homosexual sex, for example, same sex activities, right. but others as well. And at the same time, an expansion of the criminal law against certain unwanted, unconsented activity, for instance, in rape, you, you, you talk at length about ways in which rape as a criminal offense has been expanded. It's no longer just about uh, penetration. I mean, the, there are other types of non-consensual sexual conduct that can be considered a, a rape offense. Do you see, uh, I mean, do you, how do you see these trends continuing? Or where do you see areas of expansion, you know, on the horizon? Right. So on the consensual side, on the contraction side, um, for the first time in many, many years, we're seeing a number of states now that are considering the possibility of decriminalizing prostitution or at least parts of prostitution. So in particular, following the lead of most Western European countries, which is to decriminalize the sale of sex, we might continue to criminalize the, the purchase of sex, but on the supply side to decriminalize that. So that would be a big change in the U.S., um, but it's the, it seems to be the trend that many other states, uh, many other European countries in particular are following. Similarly, it's possible, one can imagine, maybe adult incest um, might be criminalized. There's not a lot of, much of a lobby for that, but, um, but <laughs> yeah. there's an argument following uh, Lawrence versus Texas and so forth that, you know, it's, if it really is a consensual um, relationship between, uh, say, a, a, a siblings who were raised separately and only meet as adults. There are many cases like that, particularly with the new DNA um, that have made that possible. People are, were raised in separate households and unaware of each other and meet each other as adults and find themselves sexually attracted. So it's not inconceivable to me that some of those laws might be um, uh, decriminalized. On the other side, on the non-consensual side, I think we're going to see an expansion or at least the consideration of expanding these hierarchical abusive position laws. Mm -hmm. So thinking more about whether uh, teachers and their adult students might be uh, included in the criminal laws or um, other kinds of relationships, uh, uh, corporate executives, government officials, um, and their aides and so forth. Uh, mm. I think we might see an expansion in that as well. Um, and certainly in the what's called affirmative consent law, which says that unless the putative victim or the complainant affirmatively consents to a sexual act, um, 
that uh, that's going to be regarded. There's going to be a presumption that there's non-consent. Wow. So New Jersey, mm-hmm. in January uh, of this year, just adopted an affirmative consent law. It's one of the few statutory laws in the United States. Wow. Um, and I think a lot of people regard that as a sort of trend that we might see mm-hmm. coming down the road. So in other words, no means no would still... <laughs> No would still mean no, but we'd we'd also have to have a yes in there somewhere. Right, unless there is a, a yes, an affirmative yes, or mm. the equivalent of it. It doesn't have to be spoken, but if it, mm-hmm. unless there's some demonstration of consent, uh, then there's a presumption of non-consent. So if you have a complainant who's just not moving at all, because say because she's scared, uh, she's so frightened by the um, the, the attack on her that she doesn't say no, the notion is that, you know, that we should infer from her uh, silence that she doesn't consent. So that's a very controversial point. Yeah. The American Law Institute, based in your Philadelphia, is just about to um, finally issue, after many years of deliberation, its final report on uh, its, its suggested revisions to the Model Penal Code. And that's been a subject of significant debate among the um, members of the ALI. Hmm. Incredible, fascinating. In the end, in the end, they decided not to follow affirmative consent, but um, there was quite a lot of debate about it. Well, and you're right. I mean, if New Jersey is the first in seeing how things are happening in the world, I mean, Harvey Weinstein was just convicted. He's the first big name. Right. Since Cosby uh, and the cases are are different enough, um, we don't know yet what the you know what all the consequences of that are, are going to be. Um, but uh, d- definitely uh, something to keep a close eye on and keep talking about. So, uh, Stuart, thank you so much. This is su- such a fascinating conversation. We could we could cover so many other. Uh, areas we didn't we didn't really get to talk about bestiality too much or voyeurism <laughs> uh, or some of the more exotic uh, um, things that you cover in your book, but all the more reason for people to uh, pick up a copy of uh, Stuart Green's new book, Criminalizing Sex, and uh, we'll put a link to the book uh, as it is just out, uh, so people can get a copy of the book. Uh, you're not going to read the history of the Harvey Weinstein trial in this book. It's not that kind of a book. But for those who want to understand the really the underpinnings of our criminal law and how our criminal law uh, continues to evolve and to try to keep up and, and keep ahead of some of the, the trends that Stuart and I have been talking about, uh, fascinating and I find very readable book. Um, so I, I encourage everybody to... Uh, get a copy and and uh, learn more about this uh, from Stuart's book, Criminalizing Sex. And Stuart Green, thank you so much for being on the program and uh, pleasure having you. It's a pleasure being being with you, and uh, I, I I appreciate I appreciate your uh, inviting me to speak. Mm-hmm.